Okay, well, thank you, Lars, and, and uh, my thanks to the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me to this very interesting uh, meeting. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, talk today on um, a um, topic which has to do with, um, with um, uh, sort of, in a certain sense, an optimal localization of uh, really initial data for the Einstein equations. And so, um, and so let me say what I'll do. Let's see. Um, so uh, I'm first going to give an introduction, I, actually just very briefly because I know that people already know this, but, I, but just to fix notation, I'll briefly go through the, um, the setup. Um, and, uh, and then secondly, I'll talk about the main theorem uh, uh, on the localization of, uh, of data. Uh, and then I'm, in part three, I want to talk about some interesting connections to the geom geometry of initial data sets, which has something to do with Riemannian geometry, as, as uh, Lars said. And then in the, in the fourth part, I'll just talk about some general features of the, uh, of the proof. And so um, uh, the, uh, the main results that I'm going to describe are, are a joint work with uh, Alessandro Carlato, and they appear in a paper which is on the archive um, listed there. Um, okay, and so... Um, so let me, I'm, I'm going to work in n dimensions here. So the, my space time will be uh, uh, n plus 1 dimensional. And, uh, and generally, then the Einstein equations take this form where T is um, uh, a stress energy tensor. And uh, the left-hand side is the usual uh, Einstein uh, tensor. Um, and, and so um, uh, of some interest for us will be the, um, the vacuum case. In fact, most of my talk really will be about about the vacuum Einstein equations. And so the, those reduce to the, uh, to the system that the Ricci curvature of G vanishes identically. Those are the vacuum Einstein equations. Uh, and then as has um, uh, been clearly um, discussed in this meeting, uh, the uh, solutions of the Einstein equations evolve from initial data. And the initial data is given on what will become a space-like uh, hypersurface in, in the space-time. This is done the three-dimensional case here in my sketch. Uh, and so the initial data for the, um, for the uh, gravitational field, G, is, uh, are the induced metric on, uh, on M now, which will be an n-dimensional manifold. So that metric is G. And that, the, metric, the induced metric is a Riemannian metric, which expresses the fact that the hypersurface is space-like. And the, uh, the initial velocity for the uh, uh, gravitational field uh, is... Um, uh, is given by the second fundamental form, which is a symmetric 0, 2 tensor, which I'm going to call P during this talk. Uh, and so these, these are the initial position and velocity uh, for the gravitational field. And then the, an initial data set is then just a triple. It's, a, it's an n-dimensional manifold with a Riemannian metric and an auxiliary uh, symmetric 0, 2 tensor. Um, and then um, uh, what's especially important for the Einstein equations is, that, um, is, is the constraints. So, so it turns out that, that, that n plus 1 of the total number of equations, uh, Einstein equations, uh, are uh, imposed constraints on the initial data. So they're non-dynamical equations. Uh, and they, they come from the Gauss and Kadatsi equations of differential geometry. And the vacuum constraints I've written here, so they're, they're n plus 1 of them. The first is the scalar uh, constraint equation, which expresses the, the fact that the, uh, the scalar curvature of the, um, uh, of the uh, metric M on, uh, metric G on M uh, is expressible as a quadratic expression uh, in P. And then the, 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 the vector constraint equations are the conditions that uh, a certain tensor constructed from the second fundamental form is divergence free. So those are the system of the vacuum constraint equations. And um, uh, if we have matter fields, so if there's a stress energy tensor, then uh, these take a, a slightly different form. They become inhomogeneous equations. Uh, where the mu and j depend on the stress energy tensor. And um, physically, the mu is the observed energy density for an observer moving uh, orthogonally to the, um, to the uh, hypersurface that we have. And j is the momentum, the observed momentum density. j is a vector or, or a one form. Okay, and so um, whenever we have non, the non-vacuum case, we always, assume, um, we always assume the dominant energy condition. And so that requires, for any initial data set, that the mass density dominates the norm of the, uh, the momentum density. And so we'll always assume that. In, in particular, in, the, in an important special case is the case when P is 0. It's called in physics the time symmetric case. It means the initial slice is totally geodesic, or that the initial velocity is 0. 
uh, which is a perfectly good initial condition for the Einstein equations. Uh, and in this case, the dominant energy condition just expresses the fact that the Riemannian metric on M has non-negative scalar curvature. So there's a very close connection between the, the, um, the, um, um, the constraint equations in relativity and scalar curvature, in particular uh, manifolds with non-negative scalar curvature. Um, OK, and then the initial value problem, which we've seen many times, says that, says that the constraint equations, let's say for the vacuum case, I, I won't talk about specific matter fields, but the constraint equations are necessary and sufficient for the uh, existence of a, a local space-time, which evolves from the data. Okay, and, so, uh, and so I'm going to be studying mostly the geometry of the, uh, the initial data sets, but the constraint equations are precisely the conditions that require, that, that allow us to evolve. Um, at least a local spacetime. Okay, and so uh, I'm going to be interested in uh, in the lecture uh, in a boundary condition, which is asymptotic flatness. And so, um, in fact, actually, what the whole lecture is about really is is the sort of asymptotic behavior which one can allow uh, in in this asymptotically flat setting. And uh, and so I won't specify right now uh, what the fall off is, but the the basic picture is that. Um, our initial uh, manifold M has some high curvature region, possibly some general region inside, but uh, outside a compact set, it looks very much like the Euclidean space. In particular, the uh, in suitable coordinates out here in the exterior region, uh, the metric falls off to the Euclidean metric at a certain rate, and the uh, second fundamental form falls off to zero. Okay, and, and as I say, I'll talk more specifically about that in. Uh, a bit later. Um, and the, the two basic examples for this talk that, to think about are, first of all, the, uh, the flat case, the Minkowski spacetime. And so that's just Rn plus 1 uh, with the uh, standard uh, Lorentz metric. Um, and uh, the second one is the Schwarzschild spacetime. And so, and so I'm going to write it here, the Schwarzschild mass I'm going to write as E for energy. Uh, and, and I've written the uh, initial data for the short shield metric in conformally flat coordinates. So that'll be uh, uh, useful for me to do uh, in the talk. And so the initial data has zero uh, second fundamental form, so it's a time symmetric uh, initial data set. And the metric is rotationally symmetric, and it's given by a conformal factor times the Euclidean metric. It's on Rn minus the origin, the singularity at the origin. Uh, <clears throat> and um, it, it um, this is actually vacuum initial data. The, the, the fact that this function is a harmonic function with respect to the Euclidean metric uh, implies that the scalar curvature of this metric vanishes identically. Okay, so this is a metric of zero scalar curvature on, um, <clears throat> on Rn minus the origin. Uh, and notice that it's asymptotically flat in the sense that it falls off at a specific rate. So it fall, if, we go, if we take x large, then it approaches the Euclidean metric up to terms that fall off like uh, uh, 1 over mod x to the n minus 2. Okay, and so this is a very important solution in relativity. It uh, describes, uh, in, at least in the three-dimensional case, a, a static black hole uh, with, with mass E, and it's a very much studied uh, solution, of course, in both mathematics and mathematical side and the physical side. Okay, and so, um, and so for, a, for a general uh, asymptotically flat spacetime, uh, it's possible to um, um, define a notion a actually under rather general con asymptotic conditions, which again I'll, I'll specify more precisely later. It's possible to define a notion of total energy which, which reproduces the short shield energy in the case that the, um, that the metric is, ha is asymptotic to a short shield plus lower order terms. And so uh, the number E can be given, so the standard expression, it's given as a certain flux integral. So you compute the integral over large spheres, and uh, there's this kind of uh, divergence uh, type term. Uh, and it turns out the constraint equations, uh, together with the appropri appropriate fall off, imply the existence of this limit. And this, this limit is called the ADM energy of the, um, uh, of the uh, initial data. And it's a quantity which is conserved under the, uh, under the evolution. Okay, and um, so, um, uh, and again, I'll specify decay conditions a little later, uh, but there's an, I should say there's an analogous expression for uh, linear momentum uh, as an asymptotic expression involving P, but I didn't write it down since I won't be using it. And similarly, there's a, there are notions of angular momentum and center of mass, assuming appropriate uh, uh, fall-off conditions as well. Um, 
Okay, and there's a basic theorem which plays a role in what I'm going to do. It's called the positive energy theorem. And what it says um, is that for any uh, physically reasonable uh, initial data, that is one which satisfies the uh, dominant energy condition, the, the energy, the total energy is, act, is strictly positive, and it's zero only in the trivial case. So the statement is that this E is always non-negative, and in fact it's strictly positive unless the, uh, unless the initial data can be embedded as a, uh, an asymptotically flat slice in Minkowski space. Okay? And so that's the positive energy theorem. And so, uh, so it requires the uh, dominant energy condition. In particular, when P is zero, it's a statement about metrics with non-negative scalar curvature on uh, uh, asymptotically flat metrics, that type. Okay, and so, um, and so, and so actually, it, 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 of course, this question was initially posed in three dimensions, but it can be posed in any dimension. Uh, and it's proven, actually, not in the literature in all cases, but uh, there are sort of two basic approaches. One, one uses mean curvature ideas that Yell and I developed, and then there's a Dirac operator approach. Um, <clears throat> and actually, in three dimensions, when P is zero, there's a third approach, which is a very interesting one uh, due to uh, Huskin and Ilman. So this is a, uh, this is a theorem which is, uh, is true, at least in, in very general, uh, general cases. Okay, and so uh, now I want to describe the main question which I want to address in the talk, and um, uh, and so um, it has to do with it has to do with asymptotic behavior uh, for initial data, and so um, so let me just say that from from um, a general point of view, we can think of the Einstein equations as lying somewhere between the general wave equation that would be a scalar field and in relativity and Newtonian gravity, or, or, um, or actually the stationary or static Einstein equations have a, have a similar property in this respect, in the sense that for the wave equation, when we solve the initial value problem, there are no constraints. And so uh, usually we solve it in some, the initial data is in some space where compactly supported, uh, smooth compactly supported functions are dense. And so if you want to prove an estimate for uh, solutions of the wave equations, it's usually enough to do that for, for compactly supported uh, uh, initial data. So the wave equation, there's complete freedom in, in the choice of initial data. Uh, on the other hand, for Newtonian gravity, uh, the asymptotic behavior is really rigidly determined. So if we look at the Newtonian potential, uh, Newtonian gravity, then, um, then its asymptotic behavior is determined by the equation, the Poisson equation. Uh, and the asymptotic terms at infinity, of course, involve physical uh, quantities. You can read the total mass from them and the center of mass, for example. Um, and, and the asymptotic form is unique. It's, it's, it's uniquely determined by the equation. And so um, the, the, Einstein equation, uh, the Einstein equations um, have the same property as the Newtonian gravity in the sense that the asymptotic terms contain physical information. Uh, in particular, as I, I wrote down the formula for the, uh, the uh, total energy, there are also, uh, there are also uh, asymptotic formulas for the uh, momentum and also for the center of mass. And so, and so again, it's a situation where in, there are certain aspects of the asymptotic behavior which are restricted or, or which are determined physically. And so, and so, um, uh, and so you can't simply uh, uh, take initial data with compact support, and for the Einstein equation, you can't do that without, without really making the data trivial, because uh, 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 because uh, a compactly supported so a metric which is Euclidean outside a compact set has zero energy, and so and so uh, it would be a trivial uh, give, give, yield the trivial space time. Okay, and so and so the the point of view I want to take, and, and, and in fact I want to. Um, hope I justify this in the talk, is that um, there's, there's a lot of flexibility, and this is also partially known, I'm going to explain, elaborate on it. So even though the, th there are certain aspects of the asymptotic behavior that are rigid, uh, uh, involving the flux integrals uh, that I've written down, the actual form of the asymptotics is, is not rigidly determined. It's, it's, uh, there are many different forms which are, which are possible. Uh, and um, um, uh, and I'll, I'll describe an, essentially a new one here uh, in the talk today. Okay, and so let me now come to more specific um, uh, asymptotics. So um, in order to have the existence of energy and linear momentum, uh, one can uh, do it under the, uh, under 
the assumption that the metric is Euclidean up to terms which fall off like x to the minus q, where q is bigger than n minus 2 over 2. So remember that the, the Schwarzschild fall off was mod x to the uh, uh, minus n minus 2, right? So you can actually define the energy under substantially weaker fall off than, uh, than Schwarzschild. If it doesn't fall off that fast, then in general the energy is not defined. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's infinite. So you need, you need certain fall off in order for the uh, total energy and linear momentum to define, be defined. And similarly, the linear momentum has to fall off uh, one order faster. Uh, and now the, the subscripts here indicate that, the, um, that I can differentiate twice. In other words, uh, the metric falls off like this, and when I take a derivative of the metric, it goes one order faster. When I take a second derivative, it goes one order faster still. So that's the, that's the two means two derivatives, and the one there means one derivative. Because you need, in order to, to prove the convergence of these flux integrals, you need some, you need some decay on derivatives as well as, uh, uh, as on, the, uh, on G and P. Okay, and, and, um, um, and so, as I said, um, obviously the, the positive energy theorem implies uh, that you cannot have solutions of the constraint equations with compact support right? because they would simply, they, they would, uh, simply give you trivial, trivial data. And so, um, actually, the positive energy theorem implies something quite a lot stronger than that. And let me, let me describe this. Um, uh, in fact, if we, if we take... Um, uh, let me call the set U to be the, so if we take our initial data set M, that's a, a Riemannian manifold, and so we can look at the set on which the Ricci curvature is non-zero, and that's an open subset, which I'll call U, and so the, the, the fact that the data is not compactly supported implies that U runs off, U is, un, is unbounded uh, in general, um, and so th these are the set of points where the Ricci curvature is non-zero. Then, um, then what, what turns out to happen is if we assume Schwarzschild decay on the data, that is, we assume that uh, the metric is Euclidean plus a term that falls off like 2 minus n. Actually, I've added a derivative there because I'm going to use a formula for the energy that requires a little more, uh, more uh, differentiation than the one I gave. Uh, and then the second fundamental form, uh, uh, one order faster with two derivatives. Uh, then, then the statement is that unless the data is trivial, um, we have to have um, the volume, if I take the set U and I intersect it with a very large sphere, uh, sphere of radius sigma, then the volume of U, so, so first of all, of course, U has to intersect that sphere non-trivially, and the volume of the intersection is a fixed ratio of the total volume of the sphere. So sigma to the uh, n minus 1 times a constant is the volume of the sphere. And so this says that, this says that the set U not only is unbounded, but it sort of contains a fixed cone angle. So as, you, as it goes to infinity, it does so with a fixed cone angle in the sense, that, in the sense of volume, at least. Um, and so um, uh, the positive energy theorem actually implies this, uh, but it, it uses a little more geometric formula for the energy. And I'm going to say a few words about the formula on the next couple slides, but, uh, the, the, because it, it doesn't seem to be that well known. Um, uh, so the, the formula is that there's, uh, the energy can also be written as a negative constant, <coughs> dimensional constant, Cn, times the, 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 this, this uh, asymptotic integral. So sigma is the radius, and this is the Ricci curvature in the normal direction. To, for the, so, the, so I'm working now on the Euclidean sphere in asymptotic coordinates, and uh, I'm computing the, uh, the Ricci curvature in the normal direction and integrating and then multiply by sigma. So it turns out that, that that's another expression which, uh, which uh, uh, gives us the, uh, the energy. And there's some constant Cn, which I'll, I'll say a little more about it in a minute. But using this expression, we can understand, we can prove the theorem quite easily because um, it, from the positive energy theorem, uh, if the initial data is non-trivial, then the energy has to be strictly positive. And so if I go out sufficiently far, the integral on the right-hand side has to be bigger than, say, e over 2. So for sigma large, this, the integral is bigger than e over 2. And then if I just estimate the integral by putting in absolute values on the Ricci, then I get that e over 2 is less than cn sigma times this integral. Now, because I've assumed the Schwarzschild decay on the, uh, on the metric, the Ricci curvature falls off like it involves second derivative, so it falls off like, like mod x, like sigma to the... Uh, sigma to the minus n, 
And so, um, and so this term pointwise is bounded by sigma to the minus n. Of course, it's only non-zero on the set u. So, so on the complement of u, the Ricci is zero by definition. Okay? And so, and so I, can, I can replace the sphere by the set u, uh, uh, intersect the sphere, because otherwise the integrand is zero. And then the decay estimate gives me sigma to the minus n, so I get a sigma to the 1 minus n, and then times the volume. Uh, so s sigma is just the boundary of b sigma. Okay? And, so, and so the, the proof is, is very, very simple. It tells us that we cannot have a non-trivial solution uh, of the um, uh, vacuum constraint equations, say, or, or, or even the general constraint equations, uh, where the metric is Ricci flat <clears throat> in, in a set which is, which is larger than, than, uh, uh, than a cone. Um, so, um, so that's, that's uh, uh, an, ob an observation about, um, about um, another application of the positive energy theorem. Let me just say a word about this. Uh, I don't know if I have time to do this. But, but, uh, but actually, the energy formula that I used in the previous expression comes from this identity. So this, uh, th this, uh, this is the, so I'm taking a general vector field x. And uh, I'm evaluating the Ricci in the x direction. So that gives me a one form. Uh, and then I, the sharp means I make it a vector field. And then when I compute the divergence of that vector field, I get terms that involve, I get terms, one term involving the conformal killing operator on x. So I call that d of x, which I've written here. So that's zero if x is a uh, conformal killing vector field. And the other terms involve the scalar curvature of the metric. Okay, so for example, in the, in the case of the vacuum constraint equations with p equals zero, that scalar curvature would vanish. And so the scalar curvature is a, is a term that, that is assumed to either be zero or decay quite quickly. OK, and so, um, and so un under the decay assumption, so the same order of decay that we described, except you need, um, uh, you need again, three, uh, three derivatives. You can probably we get by with less, but, uh, but then, uh, then you can see that um, if we take the vector field x, which is just the dilation vector field in, in asymptotic coordinates, then uh, the right-hand side, if you just study the decay of those terms, you assume the scalar curvature falls off uh, strictly faster than uh, r to the minus n, mod x to the minus n, then, um, then you can see that the right-hand side of that expression is integrable. So the fact that it's integrable on the space tells us that the flux integrals converge. It tells us that if we take the, a large annulus, we take a region between two large spheres, then the difference goes to zero. And so, and so that tells us that the, uh, this flux integral, the limit as sigma goes to infinity, uh, uh, exists. And in fact, it's not hard to see that, so near infinity, I can replace x by sigma times nu up to terms that, that don't affect the limit. So this is where that expression comes from. Um, and, uh, and then, and then the, only, the problem then is just to evaluate the limit. Uh, so what's, what, what is the value of the limit? Well, um, so, so uh, we can do that in, in, in three steps. So first of all, we can compute it for the Schwarzschild metric. Okay? And, so, um, and so it's a little calculation to do that. But it can be simplified a lot because uh, in the Schwarzschild case, of course, when I look at this identity, the right-hand side is zero if I choose, because the metric's conformally flat, the uh, radial vector field is a conformal killing vector field. And so, so, uh, so uh, the, and the scalar curvature is zero, so the right-hand side is zero. So that means that the, this expression, the integral over sigma of Ricci, nu, and x, which is the flux term I get from applying the divergence theorem, is actually a homological invariant. So it, it, it's, it gives the same answer for any any surface in, in Schwarzschild, which is homologous to the horizon. Okay? And so, in particular, we can evaluate it on the horizon. And so the horizon is just a constant distance sphere, which is, turns out in n dimensions to be that one. Uh, and then, and then on, the, on the horizon, of course, x is parallel to the, so the horizon is a round sphere, whose radius you can compute. x is parallel to the normal vector. Uh, Again, you compute the constant. And the Ricci in the normal direction, because the scalar curvature is zero and the horizon is totally geodesic, is just minus one half the scalar curvature, the horizon. So if you do that calculation, if I did that right yesterday, uh, it's, uh, it's minus Cn times E, where Cn is this sort of complicated constant. And so in, in three dimensions, it's 128 pi. 
Okay, and so, and so once you compute for the short shield, you can then argue that any metric which is, which is short shield to leading order will have the same limit, simply because the correction terms don't contribute uh, in the limit. And then finally, you can use a density argument. So you can avoid a, a rather complicated calculation by, by um, showing that, in fact, if you take arbitrary data satisfying the fall off, you can approximate it in uh, a topology in which the energy is continuous by the, um, uh, and, and for which the, the flux terms and the volume terms are, are all uniformly controlled, uh, you can approximate it by one which is as short shield to leading order. So actually these kinds of density theorems were, Yao and I proved one, used one in our proof of the positive energy theorem and their extensions to the, uh, to the general uh, constraint equations as well. And so in particular you can argue with almost no calculation that, uh, that this formula gives you the, uh, the, uh, the energy, the ADM energy. And so it's a little more geometric expression. Um, okay, and so, um, and so let me now come to the, um, to the uh, uh, main issues. Okay, and so, so, um, so then what, what, what are reasonable asymptotic forms to assume for the, uh, uh, for the constraint equations? Well, um, um, if, if you take energy and linear momentum, of course, you can achieve any energy and linear momentum by a, uh, a boosted slice in, in the short shield space time, a suitably chosen short shield. And so, so, so often people assume that the, the, um, uh, the asymptotic behavior of the initial data is, is that of a, of a slice in short shield, at least to leading order. And, um, and in fact, um, there's a general theorem which justifies that, in, in fact, in a in a uh, emphatic way. Uh, in fact, there's a work of Corvino, and Corvino and I followed up, and also Crucial and Delay. So, so we showed that, in fact, the, the set of initial data, uh, which um, um, are exactly equal to, um, so, which, so, so given any initial data set, you can keep it fixed inside a large ball, and you can transition to uh, uh, data which is an exact uh, slice in the Kerr space-time. So you actually have to allow angular momentum to do this, but, but um, uh, there's, um, you, you can actually take any initial data which satisfies the very general fall-off conditions and approximate it by one which, which, uh, which is uh, uh, a Kerr slice, exactly a Kerr slice near infinity, keeping it the same on, on, uh, on a, uh, an arbitrarily large, large uh, ball, uh, an arbitrarily large region. Okay, and so, um, so that's one type of data, but, but we asked the question, well, how, how flat can we make the data? So, so um, the, the discussion I gave using the positive energy theorem suggests that we can't flatten it out on a region which is, um, which is um, uh, uh, bigger than uh, the complement of some, of some cone. And so um, um, what we proved is that, in fact, you can, you can, you can um, uh, you can always localize the data in a cone of arbitrarily small cone angle. Okay, and so, what, so let me describe this. So, and I have a picture on the next slide. So, so what we, we do is we start with a general solution of the vacuum constraint equation. So, th so we do this in the vacuum case. Um, so we start with a general solution, and, and we're just going to, well, in fact, I'm discussing it here for the uh, time symmetric case, but we proved it in the general the general case. So we start with a metric which I'm calling G check, which is defined, which is just a, an asymptotically flat uh, vacuum initial data set with P equals zero. Uh, and then we assume the, the, uh, the usual fall off. And I haven't specified derivatives here because you have to be a little careful about that. But um, uh, let's assume that Q here is between um, uh, N, N minus two over two and N minus two. If Q is faster than N minus two, then the, the energy is zero, so there are no no solutions like that. Um, uh, and the Q bigger than N minus two over two is needed for the energy to be defined. Okay, and so uh, what we showed is that we can, find, we can find a metric, and I have a picture here. So what we do is we take a cone which is based at a point far out in the asymptotic region. So I've drawn the, the cone there. Um, and um, it, so it's based at a point A there. and the cone, the point is chosen far enough out that, that the metric is pretty, pretty close to, to flat on the boundary of the cone. And so 
the sort of large curvature region is contained inside the cone. And so um, what we can do is we can keep the metric the same inside the gray region. So in the gray region, nothing has changed. Uh, and in the exterior region here, it's called omega outside, omega O. The metric is Euclidean. So we make the metric Euclidean out here, outside a, a cone with arbitrary angle. Uh, we keep it the same inside the uh, small cone. And the blue region here is a transition region. So that's where the, the, the metric transitions from um, from uh, the original metric G check to the Euclidean metric. Uh, and of course, it still satisfies the vacuum constraint equations. So this is a scalar flat metric. So the new metric that we construct, I've called G on the previous slide. And so the requirement is that G agrees inside uh, a cone based at a point far out with, the, uh, with G check, the original one. And it is uh, identically Euclidean outside a little larger cone. Uh, uh, with angle a little larger. Uh, and it, it's also approximates, so the transition region is such that it approximates um, uh, the original metric G hat in a topology for which the energy is continuous. So the energy barely changes. It changes a little bit, of course, but it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't change much. And moreover, the new metric G satisfies um, uh, the, well, not quite the same, well, it, it satisfies the sa same decay condition if Q is less than N minus 2. So there's a point here that, that I want to make, and I want to justify this point in a minute, and that is that if you assume Schwarzschild decay for the original metric, that is, you assume that Q is exactly equal to N minus 2, then you cannot achieve that in this theorem. You, you have to reduce Q a little bit in the theorem. So you give up a little bit of decay. Um, you, we, 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 we can't impose Schwarzschild decay, and probably it's not possible for a reason that I'll explain in a minute. But, um, but you give up a little decay if Q is N minus 2. If Q is less than N minus 2, then you, you can keep the same, the same Q. OK, and so that's, the, that's a picture of the, the, the theorem. And again, we, uh, the, the, the metric G can be taken, uh, uh, can, can be taken um, essentially as smooth as the metric G hat. So it's, uh, it, it's um, it's, it's done in the, in the setting. We can do it in the setting of smooth uh, solutions of the, of the, uh, the uh, constraint equations. OK, and so, and so let me, uh, I have a little slide to uh, describe a bit about the, um, the, uh, this, this decay loss in the transition region. And so, um, so, uh, so notice I'm, I'm, I've required, in fact, the theorem wouldn't be so interesting uh, uh, if, if I were losing a lot of energy in this process. But the, the, the energy is essentially, uh, uh, essentially unchanged in, in the process. And so, and so that looks sort of implausible from this picture. Because if I started with a metric uh, g hat uh, up here, and if I computed, let's suppose g hat had nice asymptotics, then if I computed the, the flux integral uh, over a very large sphere for the metric g hat, the contribution coming from the cone part would be very sm a very small fraction of the, of the energy. And so I would expect the amount of energy inside the cone, that is in the gray region, to be, to be small if the cone angle is small. Okay, so there, there's, there's very little energy inside the, the gray region. And there's, of course, no energy outside the region because the metric is, is Euclidean. And so, and so what has to happen is that uh, much of the energy, if I choose the angle small, uh, most of the energy resides in the transition region, okay? And that suggests that you at least cannot impose uniform decay of the Schwarzschild order, that is mod x to the 2 minus n, because that would, that would force the energy contribution to be small. So you lose a little bit of decay, and, that, and that's necessary because, because the transition region has to account for um, a fair bit of the energy, at least in certain, certain cases. Okay, and so, and so that's a justification for the... Uh, for the uh, slight loss of decay in the in the case of uh, Schwarzschild uh, asymptotics. Okay, so um, I hope the theorem is clear. Okay, and so uh, another interesting consequence of the theorem is that um, we can construct. We can sort of. Do, do superpositions of vacuum asymptotically flat solutions and construct new, new solutions 
where the solutions consist of um, um, non-trivial data in disjoint regions and where, in fact, the solutions uh, uh, don't interact for a fixed amount of time. So, so what we can do, and again, I have a... Okay, so we can superimpose solutions in such a way that they don't interact. In fact, we can superimpose so that the energies, um, the, the total energy of the new system is the sum of the energies and the, the momentum. Mo momentum integrals are also, are also the sum of the momentum, and here's a nice picture of that. So, for example, if we took two uh, uh, asymptotically flat solutions, I've called M1 and M2, uh, and then we can localize each of them in a cone. So we, this is an approximation, but the metric is identical to the original in the, gray re the light gray and the dark gray regions. Okay, and then we can put them together. We can just take, take the, co the cones to be uh, uh, disjoint cones. These, these cone angles are less than pi. So we can, take, uh, uh, we can take disjoint cones and we can put the two together, and we can then construct a, uh, a solution of the, asymptotic, uh, of the vacuum constraint equations, which satisfies all of the decay conditions, and in fact agrees with the light gray one and the dark gray one in the two cone regions, and is Euclidean outside in, in this region here. Uh, and then when, then when we solve the Einstein equations, we evolve these, the two solutions will not interact at all, for at least for a short time. So it produces a rather interesting uh, kind of solution of the Einstein, uh, the vacuum Einstein equations. And actually, I, I should say, the, the construction we're doing, as is, is pretty clear, is, is sort of localized near infinity. So, so it would also work if I had initial data with matter fields where the initial matter fields are compactly supported. Of course, I could, we could then do that, keeping the matter fields the same, uh, identical. <clears throat> okay, and, and so um, let me um, now come to, um, before I give this kind of general discussion of, of uh, the ideas that go into that, uh, let me describe some connections to the geometry of initial data sets. Okay, and so, it's well known in relativity that certain geometric aspects of the initial data set play an important role in, uh, in the evolution. So, for example, a good example of that is the Penrose singularity theorem, which shows that if the initial data contains a, uh, an outer trap surface, then, in fact, the space-time is not null geodesically complete. Okay, there's another um, aspect. So, in the mean curvature proof of the uh, positive energy theorem, there's a, 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 an aspect that's a little bit related to trap surfaces. Um, uh, it, it relies on uh, a geometric theorem, which, uh, which says that um, if we assume the energy conditions hold strictly, so, uh, so we assume a strict uh, positivity of the energy conditions, then, in fact, the data cannot have asymptotically planar stable minimal surface or stable MOTs in the general case. And I'll describe MOTs here in the <coughs> next slide a little bit. And so, um, and, and so uh, the constructions we made, and in fact the solutions which are identically um, um, Euclidean outside a cone, show that in fact the strict, the strict positivity of the constraint equations is necessary in this theorem. So of course the, the solutions that are um, Euclidean near infinity contain the Euclidean planes which are stable minimal, minimal surfaces. And so, and so it shows that that so, it, so in, the, in the proof of the theorem, we did a preliminary perturbation where we, where we, where we made the, the energy conditions hold strictly. We perturbed so that the non-negativity became strict positivity, and that was used in, in, in ruling out these uh, uh, certain types of, uh, of uh, minimal surfaces or, or MOTs. And so, um, and so let me just briefly, so, so the, uh, the notion of trapping actually leads to uh, the notion of uh, a MOTS or, or, which is in the case P equals zero, a stable minimal surface. And these are solutions of the, <coughs> the um, this is for a surface sigma in the, uh, in, in, contained in M. So H is the mean curvature of sigma in M. And uh, this is the trace of P restricted to sigma. And so this condition, that's called the MOTS condition. So the trapping condition is the condition that that has a sign. And the MOTS condition is just the, it's a marginally outer trap surface. And so uh, it means that it satisfies this mean curvature type equation. And uh, uh, there's a notion of stability for these things. So when P is zero, the, the, the stable MOTs are just the stable minimal surface. And so, for example, the horizon uh, in the Schwarzschild spacetime is, a, is uh, the classic example of a stable, uh, a stable uh, minimal surface in, 
<coughs> in, uh, in uh, an initial data set. Okay, and so, um, and so uh, again, the, the question of whether you could have these stable minimal surfaces um, or stable MOTs in non-trivial data was, uh, was a, a natural uh, question to ask. And, and in, the, in the positive energy theorem, we, we showed they don't exist if you have strict, uh, the strict positivity of the, uh, uh, the, the dominant energy condition holds strictly. And so, and so it leads to a natural question as to whether you can have them uh, uh, in a non-trivial initial data set. And, and the answer is generally you can. Right? The, locally, the localization construction uh, shows that, um, that you, you, you can generally have stable uh, minimal surfaces. Uh, in fact, um, uh, and it has everything to do with the asymptotics, really. Um, in fact, um, Carlotto, a couple of years ago, showed that if you, if you take initial data, which is non-trivial uh, and satisfies just the weak dominant energy condition, but, and is asymptotic to leading order to a slice in, in the Schwarzschild spacetime, uh, then in fact there are no, in fact there are not even any complete non-compact stable mass. This is in three dimensions, of course. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so let me just say that although our construction gives counterexamples, it, it doesn't, there's still an issue that, that, um, uh, that's unresolved, namely, um, uh, our construction does not allow the possibility of, of data which decays at the short shield rate. And so it's possible that the, that the, the, um, the, the non-existence of stable um, uh, uh, asymptotically planar minimal series could be true if you assume short shield decay. And you could think of the uh, uh, Carlotto theorem as being some evidence for that. But again, I don't know whether that is true or not. But l let me mention <clears throat> another geometric property of um, of course, of, um, of um, uh, surfaces in Euclidean space is the isoparametric property. And um, in particular, of course, if I take a sphere in R3, then, um, then um, uh, it, it's an isoparametric surface. That is, it has, it has least area for its enclosed volume. And so, um, <clears throat> in particular, um, if we take one of these localized solutions, it's natural to ask whether a sphere in the Euclidean region is an isoparametric surface in that non-flat uh, non uh, manifold. Uh, and um, it turns out, so it's, an, uh, it's really an observation based on earlier work, is that in fact they are not isoparametric surfaces for sufficiently large radius. So if I take a sufficiently large Euclidean sphere, although it's locally isoparametric, uh, globally, it's not isoparametric, and so that's based. Uh, it's based on a, uh, on work of Fan, Miao, Shi, and Tam, who gave a formula for the ADM mass in terms of a deficit in the isoparametric profile. So there are various ways of, of computing the the ADM mass, and one way, which was proposed by Huskin, and in fact justified for nice asymptotics, for uh, assuming good asymptotics, uh, was this isoparametric profile. And what these guys did is they generalized this to arbitrary asymptotics. Okay? So, so in particular, the deficit in the isoparametric profile implies that the spheres, a large sphere in the Euclidean region, in fact doesn't minimize area for its volume. So it's a kind of interesting global, global um, uh, aspect that occurs. So, so in a certain sense, the sphere out in the Euclidean re region sort of sees the, the the non-flat part as well. It's, uh, so it, it's, it, it fails to be an isoparametric uh, surface. Um, and so this, um, the, the fact that the, um, uh, the, fact that the, 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 the large spheres are not isoparametric also suggests that if we take the planes in the Euclidean region, that they may not be area minimizing. So, so remember, stability means that they're locally area minimizing. I take a, any region on them, they minimize among nearby comparisons. But you can ask more generally, are they globally, globally minimizing? And, and, um, and, and so the, um, uh, uh, the su suggestion is that they're not. And actually, there's a very recent preprint by uh, uh, Chodash and Eichmere who, uh, who, who proved that, in fact, they are not minimizing. There's a, a general theorem that a non-trivial um, time-symmetric initial data set cannot contain a complete area minimizing, non-compact area minimizing surface. And so, um, <clears throat> and so that's um, uh, another uh, interesting aspect there. Um, and so uh, let me just say that um, 
the, the mean curvature proof of the positive energy theorem tells us that if we take any metric on, on a R3 or a three manifold uh, asymptotically flat with negative mass, so if, I assume, if we assume the mass is negative, then in fact it does contain an area minimizing uh, surface, which is asymptotically pointer. Of course, uh, generally, the, the scalar curvature of the metric would have to be negative somewhere. But, but so the, the sign of the mass is very much related to, uh, uh, the sign of the energy is very much related to the existence of these uh, area minimizing surfaces. Okay, and so uh, let me just finish by um, uh, just giving a general outline of the proof of the, of the theorem. And so I put back up my little sketch here. So remember, there's a, cone, there's a cone based at some point A, which is assumed to be far out. And the cone is the region in which we're going to do, our, do our, our work, our gluing. And so we're going to leave the metric alone in the gray region. So that's the gray region there. And we're going to transition in a region between two angles, theta 1 and theta 2, measured from an axis of the cone. So these are rotationally symmetric cones, uh, Euclidean cones. Uh, and uh, called the interior region there omega sub i for interior, uh, the exterior region omega sub o, the outside, and then omega is the transition region. And then, of course, uh, in order to make the domain smooth, we have to uh, uh, sort of smooth out the cone uh, near the vertex. Okay, and so, and so the, the procedure is then uh, uh, a kind of what, what's called a gluing procedure. So we're going to first take, um, we're just, we're going to first take the metric and the metric G check and transition to the Euclidean metric, we have to do it in a slightly careful way. So we, we need to do it in, in, in such a way that um, um, we, so we just take, so chi here is a cutoff function. So chi is one on the interior region and zero on the exterior region. Delta is the Euclidean metric. Um, and so I take phi to be the angle function on the cone. So I take it as a function of angle. So it turns out actually, the, the, the decay here is very important, and, and the fact that the region we're looking at is a cone is, is important because the, um, in order to have the right decay, we need to choose the transition to be, to be a function of the angle. So that sort of fits with the, sort of the, uh, the decay that, uh, that uh, we hope to have on the solutions. And so we, we just do a rough transition first. We call that metric G tilde, and then we try to correct it. So G tilde, of course, so I'm describing the proof now, by the way, just in the, in the time symmetric case, assuming P is zero. So otherwise, you have to do a similar thing with the second fundamental form, and it's a more complicated system to solve. And so, um, <clears throat> and so then what we try to do is correct this. So we look at um, the rough metric G tilde, and we want to add, um, add a perturbation H, and we want to force the scalar curvature of the new metric to be zero. And so, uh, and we're going we're gonna to take H to be uh, smooth, but supported in the region omega. So H will be smooth even at the boundary of omega, but, but its support will be in, in omega. So in other words, we'll be leaving the metric G tilde alone in, the, in both the gray region, where it agrees with G check, and the the exterior, the outside region where it agrees with the Euclidean metric, and we'll only change it in this transition region. Okay, and so, um, and so we then, because the scalar curvature, the, the, if I take the point far enough out, the boundary of the cone, the region omega, lies in a, a, a region where the metric is not real flat, but all, you know, pretty, pretty close to being Euclidean. I can sort of treat this as a, uh, as a perturbation problem. So I can, I can compute the scalar curvature of G and, and um, uh, write it as the scalar curvature of G tilde plus the linearization uh, of the scalar curvature map uh, at the metric G tilde and then plus quadratic, quadratic error terms. So it comes down to solving a problem like that. And uh, L tilde is the, a linear operator. Um, and, so, um, uh, and so we want to solve that equals zero. We want to solve it where H is supported in the region omega and has appropriate decay. So we want it to decay at infinity and also to, to decay rapidly at the boundary of the region omega. And so that's the problem. And so, and so you have to study this operator carefully. So I've written it down here. Um, and, um, and then the, the adjoint operator also plays an important role because um, we're trying to uh, prove surjectivity of the operator, and that's related to injectivity of the adjoint 
operator. And also, uh, we use the fourth order operator, L, L tilde times uh, composed with the adjoint. That's a kind of, that's a biharmonic. So that, uh, that's, that's an operator which takes functions to functions. And the leading order term is the biharmonic. And then it has lower order terms that involve uh, R tilde and its derivatives. Okay, and so, um, and so the idea for solving this problem, so if we want to solve uh, L tilde plus QH equals F, so F is some function supported in the region omega, we want to solve with H supported in the region omega. Uh, we do it by, by first studying the linear problem and then, and then getting sufficiently good estimates in the right spaces and then using a sort of uh, Picard iteration to solve the nonlinear problem. So it's like the inverse function theorem, but in very complicated spaces because we have, we have um, uh, decay conditions that are rather difficult to achieve. Um, okay, and so we need, we need, we need the uh, surjectivity of L tilde. And so again, the surjectivity of, of L tilde is related to the injectivity of the adjoint. And so it turns out the basic estimate in this problem is, is the following. And so these are, these norms here are, um, these norms are L2 Sobolev norms and the minus S there in, is the decay. So, so it means that the solution in the L2 sense decays like mod x to the minus s. Uh, and um, uh, and this, this is, again, taken in the region omega. And so the basic estimate is that if I take a function u uh, in the region omega, say a smooth function, uh, which decays at infinity appropriately, then I can estimate this term, provided s is positive. So these are L2 Sobolev norms. And now the key thing is that, is that there's no boundary condition imposed on u. So, th so this is a rather atypical sort of Poincaré type inequality in that, in, that, in that it's true without boundary conditions on, on u, provided we're in this suitable de space, decay space. Okay, and so, and so this, uh, this is actually the basic estimate. And, and the way it's applied is, um, um, so, so again, the, 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 um, the, the dual spaces, so if I, if I take a space uh, which decays in uh, uh, functions that decay in the, in the, um, the um, L2 norm, so H0 is L2, uh, like minus 2 minus Q, uh, then the dual space is decay 2 plus Q minus N. So the way the, the, uh, the, uh, the dual spaces work, and that's actually justified by this, this inequality. There's a pairing between these two spaces which is bounded in terms of the spaces. Okay, and so, uh, and so in particular, um, the basic, the way this is applied, the basic estimate is that we're gonna take S to be N minus two minus Q. So this is why Q has to be less than N minus two. So this number has to be strictly positive in order for the basic estimate to hold. And now the right-hand side, the, uh, the decay here, Q minus N, is chosen so that the dual decay is exactly minus Q. Okay, so, so the injectivity of L star in, this, in, in these spaces is going to give us the surjectivity of L in spaces where the, where it, where the solutions decay like mod x to the minus q. So, so that's why, that, that's why we, uh, we, uh, we need q strictly less in order to solve the equations to get this basic, uh, basic estimate. And actually, the bound is, is simply not true when q is uh, bigger than or equal to n minus 2. So, um, and so again, the basic idea is that the injectivity of L star implies surjectivity of L uh, uh, between the dual spaces and, and the L2 dual of this decay is exactly X to the minus Q decay, which is what we wanna, we wanna achieve in our problem. And now the other, the other point is that since we didn't require any decay near the boundary of U, the dual condition would be rapid decay near the boundary. Okay, and so what we can hope to, what we, what we can do is we can cut, construct solutions for the linear problem in spaces where we have both rapid decay near the boundary of omega and decay like mod x to the minus q near infinity. So that's the, the, the idea. So we, we, we need decay in both, in, in both senses. Okay, and you have to carry all that out. A actually, the proof is quite technically involved. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, quite a difficult analytic argument. And so let me just, let me just mention so, what some of the technical issues are. Um, so first of all, um, 
I mean, one of the key things in, in earlier gluing theorems of this type, like in the Corvino theorem or um, the, the other theorems, the, the transition region was a compact region, and that made a huge made, made life much easier. In this case, the transition region is in fact non-compact, and this this creates a lot of difficulties in doing the problem. In fact, um, uh, but but of course, one thing that helps is the is the homogeneity of the region, the fact that we have we have homogeneity. So that's that's quite important, uh, both for the basic injectivity estimate and also the higher order estimates that, that, need to, that I haven't described. Um, and, um, and, and actually, I should say, the, I've only really described the case, uh, the time symmetric case where P is zero. In the general case, there are additional complications, well, coming from the fact that the system is just much more complicated to begin with, but also um, uh, for the general constraint equations, and also uh, the fact that the equations are of mixed order uh, is a complication. So, so remember in the vacuum constraint equations, the scalar equation is second order in G, but the vector equation is only first order in P. And so you have to kind of um, uh, take that into account in the, in the estimates. And then, of course, the other thing which I mentioned on the previous slide is there are two different decay rates which have to be imposed. So, so we, we, we need the solutions to decay rapidly, as rapidly as we wish, at the boundary uh, of the uh, said U, but that should be omega, the transition region, in order to make the, the patch solution smooth enough. So we, we want them to be, to be smooth enough. And secondly, we need, to we need to maintain the decay rate mod x to the minus q uh, at infinity, actually both for the metric and the, uh, the second fundamental form. And again, these are handled by working in spaces where uh, we impose double weights. So there's a weight that imposes the decay at infinity and a weight that, that imposes the uh, decay uh, near the boundary, okay, and so those are those are some of the technical issues that are involved. And um, okay, so I think I'm I'm finished. I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, when you choose your, your cone, um, can you choose it as uh, thin as you want? Or? Yes. For any, um, for, yeah, theta, theta 1 and theta 2 are arbit arbitrarily chosen. Yeah. Of course, it affects the decay rate. Uh, well, it affects the constants. We, we can also keep the same, same decay rate, but we can choose it thin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? Um, I, uh, I have a uh, related question. Um, I mean, so this construction is that do, are you restricted to using, um, to doing this gluing in, in, in uh, regions which have the geometry of the cone? I mean, now you can do, it seems like you can do almost anything. So can you also glue in a region which is not, um, which, which is more, general than, uh, than uh, such a cone in Euclidean space, so to speak? Well, um, the, uh, the, the calculation, the, the theorem we gave in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the non-flat set says that you can't expect to do it in a, a region which is too thin uh, without, losing, without losing substantial decay. Yeah. So if you, if you took a region like a strip, which is, which is uh, somehow bounded, then I wouldn't expect to be able to get to to do it. Now, it may be that there could be a, a very subtle theorem that if you, if you take something which, which is slightly less than a cone near infinity, you can do it provided you weaken the decay sufficiently. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't done that. So our, our, uh, we've done it really just in the, uh, in the case of cones. I, I suppose you might be able to do something in regions that are asymptotically conical. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, mm -hmm. I think it would be quite hard to change the geometry too much. Mm -hmm. Infinity. Okay, very interesting. Um, okay, so, um, well, I think, uh, so, 
I think, so let's wrap this up. So I'd like, I'd like to thank uh, Rick again, and we should also thank all the speakers in the conference and the participants. And so on behalf of, of Philippe and Sergio. Uh, yeah, thanks also to the organizers. Thank you.